Hello, welcome to an F585 video on uh, fiscal policy. Now, um, what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to start off by recapping hopefully what you already know about fiscal policy. And I'm not going to recap everything, otherwise uh, that would be adding probably another 40 minutes onto the video. And it's already 40 minutes long probably, so you know, don't waste too much of your time. Um, just a little bit, but as I said, you know, mention it a few times. Anyway, um, okay, so there is... If, if you're not familiar with fiscal policy at all, um, then please do check out the F582 video on fiscal policy in my um, F582 playlist, obviously. Uh, and that will give you a bit of a... that will give the AS understanding. Now, in that video, I did cover some topics that uh, you are taught at A2. Um, but what I'm going to do in this video is, as I said, give you a recap of AS, a very quick recap, if anything at all. Um, and then we're going to be moving on to uh, the ins and outs of A2 fiscal policy. Okay, so to start off with AS fiscal policy, well, what you were taught was you would say it's a demand management policy. In other words, it impacts directly on aggregate demand. And that's because the components are government spending and taxation. Now, obviously, that taxation is split down. You learn direct and indirect tax. Um, and an indirect tax is just a tax on expenditure, it's the same for everyone, as a, whereas a direct tax is so it's something like an income tax, okay, where we increase it with um, someone's income. Okay, uh, we also talked about the government spending, how that's broken up, which we said that was broken up into current expenditure, which is the day-to-day -day payments of the, uh, that the government has to make to keep the economy running, so that's you know, wages to NHS staff or public services. Um, and then we also mentioned that it has uh, transfer payments, these are benefits really to um, people who are unemployed, sort of job seekers allowance, so that kind of thing. Um, also, debt interest repayments when the government bought, borrows money, which is something um, we're going to go on to look at in, uh, obviously in this video. Uh, they have to pay interest back, okay? We're going to look at the effects of that on the economy. Um, so, in the other one, I'm just going off the top of my head, uh, is capital expenditure should have known that which is you know spending on roads uh buildings infrastructure that kind of thing okay so that um and then we went on to say okay well obviously the advantage and disadvantages mainly arise when we draw in the keynesian long run aggregate supply curve which really the long run aggregate supply is more of an a2 topic but i'm not going to go over it in this video because uh, i did it in the f582 really um to build you up to it okay so if you don't get that please do check that one out um but the overall evaluation that we said for fiscal policy last year is we said, well, it depends on what other policies the governments are using. So if the government's using an expansionary fiscal where they increase their spending and decrease the tax, so should shift accurate demand to the right, well, what happens, what's happening to monetary policy? Is it using a, uh, a contractory or deflationary monetary policy where they, um, you know, increase in the rate of interest, that kind of thing, okay? Um, so they're the evaluation, and I think we also said about the tax, we said, well, what type of tax is it? And this is the key thing, actually, for the evaluation for fiscal policy, um, because it can but it can be both a demand management and a supply-side policy, because if we spending the government spending on um, investment, then, well, that stimulates longer aggregate supply. And also, if the tax is acting on a corporation, if you're reducing corporation tax, obviously increases the funds available for investment which leads obviously to believe that if there's more funds for investment the logical assumption is uh, generally that more form, for, for forms, uh, uh, firms will invest which will also lead to increased investment which stimulates not only aggregate demand but long run aggregate supply as well because we're increasing the quality and quantity of factors of production okay so that's all of the AS um, not knowledge really pretty much summed up in a in a few minutes, okay? So, sorry if I wasted your time there, but just to make sure we're all on the same page and I'm not assuming stuff that you don't know. Okay? Right. Um, so, really, the stuff we're going to look at in uh, the A2 fiscal policy, we're going to start off by looking at the deficits that the government faces. Now, um, we're really talking about the budget deficit here and the actual... Uh, more focusing on the budget deficit rather than the uh, national debt, but we are going to go into that as well. Um, the... So, and then we're going to look at um, how, how, how the government corrects that deficit level and how that impacts on uh, you and I's consumers and banks and building societies. And then we're going to look at a couple of rules that the government's come up with 
for fiscal policy. Now, the key thing that uh, when we get to this stage is uh, that stage is we talk about these. These are no, no penalties behind them. They're just self-imposed. Okay, so the the policy doesn't come with any penalties because obviously the government would probably just be paying a penalty to itself, and otherwise that'd be pointless. Um, and then I'm gonna uh, sum it all up and say, well, what is the actual impact of this? Okay, so the two two uh, deficits that the government may face. Uh, one is called cyclical, the cyclical deficit. And you can already start to get an idea of what that one is if you haven't already. Okay. And the other one is called a uh, structural deficit. Now I'm going to start with the easy one. Um, well actually they're both fairly easy to understand. But the one that you're most likely to get straight away without me saying anything. Because I'm lazy. Okay. Uh, it's this cyclical deficit is the one I'm going to start by explaining. Now, you will hear the word cyclical and think of a couple of things. You will think of cyclical unemployment or uh, the economic cycle, because obviously that closely you know, related. And it's more to do, this is more to do with the economic cycle, okay? Basically, um, in our, uh, if we draw a quick sketch of the economic cycle, it looks like something like this, if I can actually draw. But if we've got a trend GDP, of an economic cycle that does something like that, where we have a negative output gap here and a positive output gap here and here with a trend GDP. Okay, sorry for my rubbish writing. But this cyclical deficit occurs um, when the government spends more, so it occurs sort of when we're going, uh, just the output, when we're increasing our output beyond the trend GDP. And really, this cyclical deficit arises from something we call um, automatic stabilisers. Okay, as you guess, automatic means there's no intervention from the government. But basically, um, if you were to define, define economic, um, automatic stabilisers, it's just the natural um, trend that the government follows in terms of the natural spending that occurs from the government in uh, over the course of the economic cycle. Okay, so I'll try and explain this to you in terms of the economic cycle, obviously. So when we're increasing output, um, or if you start from here if you want, when we're increasing output, the government's spending more, trying to get more, uh, the economy going again. Okay. Sorry, and at the bottom, sorry, at the bottom, the government trying to spend more, which is obviously increasing the output, but it's also increasing the deficit as well. And then when they start to go to the slowdown, the economic slowdown, they're reducing the spending because, oh, well, the economy's going well, there's no need to keep ploughing money into it, it's, it's, it's doing, you know, a, a good enough job, okay? And uh, at the same time, the government's receiving more income tax, so we've, we've, we start to get, you know, a budget surplus here and then we go back to a budget deficit and it follows the pattern, okay? And this cyclical deficit just, it's sort of the budget deficit really, um, but don't label it as the same thing because it's a quite similar, okay? But um, cyclical deficit just is defined by um, arising from automatic stabilisers over the course of the economic cycle. As I said, that just really it implies that when the government's spending more to try and increase output, so it's not getting as much in from income tax because people are unemployed because output's lower. Um, but you know, as output increases, uh, the government doesn't have to spend as much and they will get it back. Okay, so really, cyclical deficit is the deficit over the whole of the economic cycle. And um, this will lead us to something we call the golden rule later on, which I'm not going to mention now because we we'll want to get onto the structural deficit, okay? So that's the slick cyclical deficit, just automatic stabilisers really causing that, okay? Which uh, sort of smooths this economic uh, economic cycle out. Now the structural deficit, or well, structural, arises from uh, changes in the economy structure. I do think about rewording that, but I think it's easier to do, guys. Structure. Okay, and really what we mean by this is not so much a complete and utter change in the. Well, it can be anything really in terms of, you know, it could be a complete increase in certain uh, jobs, okay, which, which leaves people out of work, which means the government has to spend money on job seekers' allowance and, uh, you know, health benefits, catering for these people are unemployed, probably council estates or, or whatever it might be, okay. Um, but really, in, in terms of this, uh, the current economy, um, we'll talk about the structural deficit. Is the deficit that arises, uh, you know, aging population or um, single parent families has been an increase in that as well. Okay, um, so really that's what the two deficits are, and these are associated with fiscal policy because fiscal policy 
really is it's made, it's primarily used to control the government's budget at the moment. Um, I mean, there's a couple of rules that go along with it as well, but they're the main ones, really. Okay, so they're the two deficits. Now, the government has to obviously finance these deficits. Um, and last year in in uh, the F582 video, I referred to this as a public net, net sector cash requirements, so PNCSR, I think, um, if, we can, if I did that right. Okay, and now it needs to finance these two deficits, okay? And the way it does that is it, because if, if these are increasing or, or, or changing over time, that they generally are increasing over time, um, the government has to get more people to buy bonds because that's how the government finances this public sector net cash requirement, okay? Which is the debt that the government accumulates over a year where, where the tax revenue is less uh, than, than the actual money it spends, okay? So... If that's increasing and the government needs to get more of this, then what, or, or it's changing, you know, it's doing the same. As long as it's not decreasing, the government's going to need to keep financing this, okay? And the way it does that is through um, government bonds, as I said. And the only way that the government will get more people to buy bonds, or, or foreign investors, to, or investors at all, to buy bonds, is by increasing the rate of interest, okay? And if the government increases the rate of interest on its, on its bonds, Okay, this means the individual who buys the bonds get a greater return. Okay, but if if the government increases the uh, the actual money it's it's giving out to these people who buy these bonds, then people generally have otherwise have it in banks. Okay, in building societies. And remember, the rate of interest is not only uh, the well, actually it doesn't matter. I'll point that later. Okay, but basically the rate of interest, the rate of return you get on. Um, putting your money in a bank or, or a current account, okay, so something. Um, but if the government is increasing its rate of interest on these bonds, then to make sure that the banks still have the money there so they can sell it to um, firms to invest, they need people to keep their money in the bank. Um, and the way that they do that is by increasing the interest rate. So when the increase, so let's sort of sum up what we've got so far, okay. So when the government increases the interest rate on its bonds, so government bonds increase the interest rate, okay, because they want more people to buy the bonds, then these people um, who have got their money in the bank, the banks will therefore increase their rate of interest, okay? Banks increase their rate of interest too. Now as we said, as we mentioned before, the rate of interest is not only the amount that um, the individual gets as a return on their, for saving their money in a bank, the rate of interest is also the cost of borrowing, okay? And um, if, if the cost of borrowing increases, this leads us to think, oh, well, okay, then there's going to be less investment in the economy. So, really, what I'm saying is, the more people buy government bonds, okay, because the interest rates increase, yes, the banks will increase their interest rate as well, that, that's kind of a given, really, but the government's taking the money out of the economy, really. Um, then basically, what what happens is this called this crowding out effect, which is what we've just expe what we've just explained really, um, crowding out, which is where the government takes the money and and there's no really it's very expensive for firms now to invest, which means there's going to be less uh, private sector investment. Okay, so the crowding out really just uh, it, it starts on the government's bonds increasing their interest rate. Which means banks have to increase their interest rate, which means that it's very hard for private sector firms to invest, more expensive, so therefore we assume investment to decrease, okay? Which obviously you could say therefore leads to decrease in aggregate demand, okay? So that's crowding out. Now, what I mentioned before is I sort of pointed it out when I drew the um, economic cycle diagram, okay? I mentioned this thing called the um, the golden rule. I think I did anyway. Uh, if I haven't, I've mentioned it now. Um, when I was saying the government, I was I was talking about these rules that the government has to abide by. Okay, that, that the um, they come up with for fiscal policy. Now, as I said, these are self-imposed, so there's no penalty apart from the financial credibility of the government. Obviously, not achieving these rules. Now, you might go, what the hell are these rules he's going on about? Why don't you just tell us these rules, well, you pathetic, imbecile human being? Uh, then I will. Okay? Uh, the first rule is, uh, uh, is generally the, the more difficult one. It's a golden rule. Okay? Now, 
for me, I had something at uh, uh, Prime called Golden Time. That that was the best time uh, that I had um, of my life, which is quite sad. Uh, it's, you know, you sat on the corner and you played cars or whatever, or trains or, or whatever we did in prime school. I remember making cookies once, that was pretty nice. Although uh, the cookies were like, you know, 50p. Anyway, back to this economic stuff. It is different, okay? So golden rule is just a rule, as I said, that I created for fiscal policy. And in essence, it states uh, that governments can only borrow to invest, okay? So they can only borrow to sort of quantitative easing, if you can think of it like that. They uh, can only borrow to invest. They can't basically use uh, borrowed money to finance their day-to-day -day or, or current expenditure. Okay, and the way to think about this is the government obviously can't borrow. The the, the government the tax revenue that government receives must cover all of their day-to-day -day spending. So spending on public services, the NHS, schools, um, you know the infrastructure, that kind of thing, okay? So, no infrastructure, sorry. The day-to-day -day costs of running the economy, okay? So really, any extra spending must have been on investment. Now, this golden rule does allow um, the cyclical deficit, okay? It, it says that the, the, there can be a cyclical deficit, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as the spending is primarily on investment so that they can... Um, quickly get back to the trend GDP or above it, okay? Um, and that's pretty much the golden rule. Now, there is a, there's nothing more on that golden rule apart from uh, a couple of different ways of saying it, but really that's the key thing. If they can only borrow to invest, so they can't spend on capital, uh, can't spend on current expenditure. Now, there's this other one called the sustainable investment rule. So the sustainable, sorry, I do apologize. Um, the all right stuff here. Uh, there's a sustainable investment rule, okay, um, and basically this is just, it's almost like a formula with an answer that you need to be, be able to understand, that's essentially what this is, and it says um, that the net GDP, at any given point, the net, G, the net um, debt from the government over the net GDP, so the total debt of the total GDP that the economy has produced times 100, must be around 40%. If it's any higher than that, then uh, the government is making up too much of the economy's um, I've got to take stuff off. Um, the, the economy's actual GDP, okay? So, and if they're not investing, if the, if the government is borrowing too much money, um, it's going to be a debt-fueled investment, as you can see, and it won't, won't stimulate the economy. The economy's going to end up some kind of downturn, okay? So that's really the sustainable investment rule. Two, the rules are actually quite quite simple, really, and there's nothing too much on them. Okay? Um, now, the evaluation of fiscal policy, which is the last bit. Um, now, it can, I've kind of already said it, I've evaluated through this video, um, and pretty much what the evaluation states is that these rules, I'm putting a board behind me, if actually for once I turn around and something's there, um, they're self-imposed, so there's no guarantee, um, you know, that they'll be stuck to. And especially in the run-up to an election, when, you know, this is why uh, when you were a kid, you always heard your mum and dad's going, oh, for God's sake, politicians always lie. Uh, and that's because none of them learn the mistakes from the past. Uh, because the fiscal policy can look very good in terms of, you go, oh, well, we're going to do an expansionary fiscal policy. That's great. We're going to reduce your tax so you have more money to spend if you vote with us. And as soon as they get in power, it's, oh, actually, this isn't going to be a long-term solution. Um, and you've already voted this in. You can't kick us out. Um, and I'm David Cameron. I'm going to go and kiss a pig. Okay? Um... So the message from that is essentially uh, that the well politicians are liars. You should know that. But really, if the government is left to um, alt get uh, sort of put a spin on these uh, components of fiscal policy, I almost I forgot what it's called. It. Uh, if they are allowed to control fiscal policy, the world will descend into um, anarchy. Well, obviously, it will as well. But that is due to the um, Oh my goodness, this is embarrassing, I've lost my words. Uh, oh good. Yeah, so they can be, fiscal, the fiscal policy can be used as a, fis, um, as a political tool uh, to gain more votes, okay? Which means that it won't 
uh, you know, when the government's in power uh, for a given period of time, it will look after the economy. But then when it starts to get uh, to a, a to a you know an election and they think they're going to lose, then they will use um, this policy to sort of uh, you know give them a bit of buoyancy of votes. Okay, um, so the only the only credit bit, the only thing that they will lose, the only sort of penalty if you can call it that of um, manipulating or, or breaking this golden rule and the sustainable in investment rule is political credibility. Now obviously to the general person of the economy, so the general citizen, they're not going to know the difference. But obviously the people who actually know about economics and obviously you as well, uh, now will re realise that they, um, they made a, you know, they, they can't stick to basic rules um, of using fiscal policy. Okay, and There's no government that is, you know, credible enough to uh, stick to the M2 rules uh, throughout the whole duration of their stay, or whatever, okay? Um, right, so that's pretty much fiscal policy from what you should know at AS to what you should know at A2. Now, obviously, um, I haven't drawn any diagrams here, but you in F585, you, you could get, you know, discuss the effectiveness of fiscal policy at some stage, into you know, some kind of manipulation where you, you you have to discuss that as well in some sub part of your question, uh, which you just obviously count on your F582 knowledge of drawing them diagrams, defining it, defining, uh, you know, your typical um, components, what affects it, and you could go on. As I said, I'm pretty sure I did an 18 mark example in my fiscal policy video. If I didn't, please do let me know and I'll do another one. Um, but I'm I remember doing it last year, so just have to upload it if not. Okay, so thanks for watching, and uh, the next policy we're going to be looking at is monetary policy, and I'm going to be doing the exact same thing as what I did for uh, this video in terms of, well, say, we're not going to be calling it monetary policy and doing the exact same video, because uh, that'd be lazy, although I've just come up, that's a pretty good idea, because uh, you don't, nobody watches it anyway. Uh, so anyway, I'll be doing the same principle as that, I'll be going through the AS recap, and then I'll be doing the additions for A2, um, and a bit of an evaluation at the end as well. But it, it, one thing to stress with the monetary policy, I'm going to be doing, introducing you um, to a diagram, which I'll give you the proper name for in the video. I don't want to give too much away in this video, obviously, um, you know, for next time. We're going to be over a diagram, and it's, it's not necessarily a diagram that you need to understand, well, that you need to remember, sorry, but it's just one to get you thinking about the impact of the interest rate on the economy as a whole, and not just one or two small parts of it. Okay, so thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.